Oh, hello, I didn't see you there. My name is Abe Hunter, and I'm the founder of the Lead Society. And Richard, what a day we've had. This is this is a double header, I think they called it in, in baseball. I think so. I was going to say, this is a little deja vu. And we have to stop meeting like this, except this right? time we get to meet with the fabulous Mark Thomas Ketterson. <laughs> the fabulous, thank the you. The fabulous, the one and only. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Are you calling from the Windy City? I am calling from the Windy City. That's where I live. Are you um, Are you on the Miracle Mile? No, I am not on the Miracle Mile. I am too poor to live on the Miracle Mile. <laughs> I, I, I am. <laughs> no, I, do you know the city? Yeah. Chicago? I'm, Chicago. I'm kind of in an area, um, sort of depending on what realtor you speak with, <laughs> I'm I'm either in Ravenswood Manor or Albany Park. I'm in Albany Park, uh, <laughs> but um, sort of on the borderline of those neighborhoods. I'm about, uh, oh, oh, four or five blocks north and about 15 blocks west of Wrigley Field, okay. if that place yeah. is, yeah. So the Got brown it. line. So the brown line, yes. <laughs> I'm actually the next to the last stop on the brown line. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, welcome, and, and uh, Richard calling from sunny Florida, although is it still daylight? No, of course it's not daylight of there course, I mean, I, I understand that for both of you being so high on, like, you know, when it comes to latitude, that the sun goes away at, like, 3.30, but yes, it is dark yeah. here by now. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, both of you. Um, Thank you. Now, some of us may know you as as a um, critic. Is that is yes. that a term you, you identify with? Yes, and and for, I I I want to say first of all we get going here. Thank you so much for having oh, me it's, because of I was so when when you guys first invited me, I felt extremely anxious about this, and I was thinking like you know, oh no, I don't want to do this. But you know, as I've sat with it, it's actually feeling kind of delicious because <laughs> nobody asks people like me about me, you know. So it's kind of like. This is kind of wonderful. Well, and we've never been described as delicious, so I it's, it's a two way street. <laughs> well, there we go. But so so I told Richard if if um his job, if if I begin to have a panic attack on camera, you are to cut to Richard real quickly and he's gonna be charming and loquacious. I, I can and, do it. I, I have the power right here. <laughs> Mark, I, I it's so I I've been looking forward to this because we rarely get the chance to to speak with somebody that does what you do, and oh, wow. I, I mean, do you? Can Which, you? Because just... nobody likes us. So, <laughs> but and, and that's what we're trying to change. Yeah, that's critics why are we're people here. too. We're your PR <laughs> firm for a day, like you know. So what is it? So tell us about your job. Yeah, like, uh, well, I'll tell you about it. First, there's a couple of things I do in life. Actually, I. I I should say, as well as doing the writing by by degree and licensure and all that stuff, I'm actually a clinical social worker, um, work, do counseling. I worked in uh, private practice here in Chicago for a lot of years, and I still do well, um, employee assistance program work for a large company here. So that that's that part of me. Um, the other part of me, that that's not what we're here to talk about, the part of me that we are here to talk about, yeah, couple of things i would say you know um a critic and and i guess you would call me a music journalist i mean in terms of um um the critic part of me my my main gig is with opera news magazine i've been the uh chicago guy for opera news for oh god almost 20 years now um oh, wow. quite Congrats. Some, um yeah um i've also i also do have done some um yeah, um you know, as a critic, work for the Chicago Tribune and um, Chicago on the Isle and some of the other like internet, you know, criticism things. In terms of um, sort of arts journalism, I'd, I'd call it where I do things like uh, um, feature articles, um, program articles, you know, for different companies or artist interviews. Um, I've done work for Playbill, um, work for Chicago Magazine. In terms of companies here locally, I've done a lot of program writing for Lyric Opera of Chicago, um, a lot of writing for the Ravinia Festival, which I have to say I love because um, 
opera is my main love, but with Ravinia is so eclectic. It's like I get to write about different kinds of music and speak to people about different kinds of music. And I love most music. So, um, you know, that is kind of a do you, wonderful thing. Do you like thing. art song? Oh, <laughs> Yes, can't you tell can't you tell abe that entire stack of cds behind him that's all art song uh well no it's not all art song but i'll tell you what is really terrifying is that this stack of cds this is actually the overflow rack oh the, my the, god the, the the main racks are out in the hallway this is this is the mark extras. i i have to tell you i get made fun of by people that are under 30 because i still collect cds <laughs> um <laughs> You know those Facebook things that go around like, you know, you're really old if you remember this TV show or you're really old. One went around recently and it was like, you're really old if you have any, any of these in your house. And among the list were CDs and DVDs. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, well, that seals it. Yeah. Um, well, you're in good company, Mark. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we all do. But so in terms of that, I mean, in terms of program writing, I do for them. Um, outside of Chicago, I've, I've done work for um, um, Washington National, the Kennedy Center. I've done work for Wolf Trap. I've done work for Houston Grand, um, you know, in terms of program writing and interviews and so forth. Um, that's me. That's what I do. So in a nutshell, anybody who's gone to see a performance at any one of those places, anybody who's performed at one of those places has probably seen your work or had have you had you write about them? Possibly. Um, you know, it's, it, it's I'm not a regular in all of those all of those places. So but possibly. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of where this came from, it, it's, it, my stories may be a little odd because I never um, People are ask me, I was like, you know, where did you go to journalism school? And, you know, who mentored you in this? Uh, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> none of that happened. I I actually, it's where I, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and at the time I was growing up in Nashville, Nashville had, there was no opera. You know, it, we had the Opry, of course, but um, there was no opera in Nashville. Nashville now has a wonderful, Oh, um, yes. Opera company um, run by wonderful director John Holmes, who does some wonderful things. I will say I'm getting ahead of myself, but one of the things I did that I was most pleased was some years ago, I, I had a feature on Nashville Opera in Opera News. And um, having been kind of this sort of artsy, nerdy kid, you know, in Nashville growing up and kind of this, you know, an opera fanatic in a city where it wasn't there. Were you the one with shelves of LPs lining yeah. their bedroom? Yes. Yes. You know, the one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was I was that kid. Um, it, it, speaking of delicious, it was kind of delicious to be able to go back to my hometown to do a story about the opera company in my hometown it, there, there was something wonderful about that, and I am I'm eternally grateful to the magazine for giving me that opportunity because it was a wonderful thing. But anyway, at that time, the, you know, there was not a lot of that around. You know, we had we had the symphony and so forth, but I had parents who wanted us to be exposed to things, and my sisters and I were involved. Na Nashville had and still has one of the best um, professional children's theaters in the country. Um, still in existence. My sisters and I were involved in that. My my mother, I'm really going to date myself, but most people of my generation will remember this. My mother brought records home from Kroger's. They were like bonuses at the grocery store called The World's Greatest Music, which, you know, then exposed me to to music. And I would like play the Nutcracker Suite and dance around the living room. And I thought my family thought I was very odd and I was but <laughs> you know so I had that exposure um but I also that that this is um a little bit a little bit of showbiz trivia I, I was partially raised by a puppeteer by the name of Tom Titchener if you remember the Broadway show Carnival mm -hmm. um in the early 60s you know based on little like Tom had done the puppets for um, um Carnival he was actually from Nashville 
And later when I was growing up, he, he was back in Nashville and he, he did like children's stuff on television and in the libraries and stuff. And I worked with Tom for a number of years. So I, I got exposed. I remember we did uh, scenes from Hansel and Gretel, the Humperdinck Hansel and Gretel. So I had that exposure. And actually it was through Tom, I saw my first opera, if this counts, which was the Salzburg Marionettes doing Zauberflirte. Yes. Of course, yes. Uh, awesome. That is a good show. I remember oh, that fab one. <laughs> Fabulous. And it's like, it, it's burned into my brain. I was a kid, but it's like burned into my brain to this day. So that, in a sense, was my my first opera, my operatic exposure. And through through um, my relationship with Tom as this kid, I spent a fair amount of time, actually, as an adolescent in, in the recording studios in Nashville doing, like, voiceovers for children's film strips and stuff like that. And, and you know, and he would use music. So that, that all just sort of, you know, fed me there. Um, if you want to talk about first operas, my actual first opera came as a teenager. My first trip to New York um, was at the New York City Opera was Traviata. Hmm. Uh, with That was my first opera. Re where? <laughs> in no less than um, the, the big house of uh, in Bemidji, Minnesota at the university, the small state well, school hey, there hey. in 1996. Wow. Wow. Yeah, no, this was a huge experience for me. It was the, the Violetta was Marisa Galvani, if yes. you remember that name. Uh, the baritone was John Darren Camp. Uh, I can't remember who the tenor was, but it... Um, they don't matter. I, I, yeah, yeah, who cares about that? <laughs> they... they um, this actually, I will tell you, this was one of my great operatic mistakes uh, because, mind you, I was a kid, right? I was a kid. And we were in New York and I had a couple of days to play with and I knew I wanted to see an opera. And of course, the thing to do would be to go to the Met. Um, I remember the Met was doing Rosen Cavalier one night and a Wagner the other night. And I thought probably correctly where I was that those might be a little hard for me. So I looked at... Um, New York City Opera, and the one night was something that probably would have been hard for me, and the other night was Traviata, which I knew. That's so the one, I yeah, it, it, and and it was. I have to say, it was a perfect um, experience, and I appreciate it. When I say it was my great mistake, because the one I did not had I had I gone the alternate night, I would have seen Beverly Sills do Anna Bolena. Oh, uh, yeah, which I didn't. But the Traviata was wonderful. I mean, I, again, I was a kid. I remember being very impressed that they sold cocktails in the lobby. <laughs> and <laughs> I was up in the balcony, and at the end of, of Semper Libra, um, Galvani cracked, a, she interpolated the E flat, and she cracked a little bit. And all the people around me gasped and clucked their tongues. And I thought it was thrilling. I <laughs> thought it was <laughs> thrilling. So, um, you know, so I guess w what I'm saying with all my babbling is, you know, I became an addict, you know, very much an opera buff and an addict. Then fast forwarding, I talked to Richard about this on the phone the other day. Um, later, as, uh, I actually was an actor as a young man. I'm not famous. I never did anything. You never heard of me. But you haven't uh, been reviewed. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, that, it, it, I have a story for you. Yes, I did. Um, I, I got, I mean, I did work. I got, I got my equity card when I was about 22 and I did, um, you know, things in the regional theaters and, and, you know, some things locally. Um, hold that thought because I have a story. I, I think that's important that I have that background because number one, I mean, I have a performance background, but I also think it's important that it's not an opera. Um, you know, so I don't, I have no ax to grind there. I mentioned too, I also studied voice for several years. Um, never had any ambition to be an opera singer. Um, you know, that was never something I was headed for, but I did, I did mostly straight plays, but I did at that time, like in dinner theaters were very popular then. And you do things like Godspell in 1776 and the Fantastics. So I, you know, studied voice for that. So I studied semi-seriously in the sense that, you know, 
I went through the 24 songs. Um, I went through all of Vakai. Mm, yes. uh, you know, good. so, so, you know, I, again, I had like, I think it's significant that I, it gives me kind of a working knowledge of the human voice, which I can feel, but I never tried to be an opera singer and never. So, you know, I got no dog in that race. Um, no, Mark, I'm sorry. I just, one second. Um, one of our viewers uh, may remember the tenor that sang at your production. Is, was it Michel Molese? The, the the great tenor, the great Italian tenor who at 60 died in 1989. I don't. Well, he certainly sang with Sills a great deal, of, you know, a lot. Um, I don't know. All right. Um, keep, okay, audience, keep trying. I mean, we'll, yeah, you can just I, go I, into I, the New York City Opera Archives. I, I, I'm wanting to say no, because I, th I mean, he's a pretty significant name, I think. I, I'm wanting to say no, but I would be thrilled to be wrong about this. I, I, I hope it was him. All right, never mind. Um, I'll just sit here and no, that's my right. audio now. But anyway, I want to go back, kind of after all the background, I want to go back to you. when you asked, was I ever reviewed? Um, that is a really important question because I want to share an experience. I, I was in, um, during that period of my life, I was involved in a theater here in Chicago, which is long gone, called the St. Nicholas Theater. It was founded by the playwright David Mamet um, and the director Stephen Schachter. And I did actually a fair amount of work there. Um, one of the things I did there was a production of Lillian Hellman's Another Part of the Forest, which is the prequel to The Little Foxes. So, you know, it takes place in the post antebellum South. When we were working on that show, um, they brought a dialect coach in to help everyone with the Southern dialect because pe people who are not from the South, when they try and do a Southern dialect, they kind of tend to go to this hee-haw kind of thing. You mean you they know? don't just default to, to Tara? Yeah, I, I go a little, <laughs> I go, I go, I go yeah. Blanche Devereaux when I go to some, my Southern <laughs> I am Blanche Devereux. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, excuse me. They brought a dialect coach in. And now, mind you, at this point in my life, I'd been out of Tennessee for about 20 minutes. And if you think I have a twang now, you should have heard me 40 years ago. I mean, you know, I, I sounded very Southern. And so everyone was very jealous of me because they had the dialect coach in and, you know, and everyone was struggling and I was like, piece of cake. I don't even have to pay attention. It was very funny. Well, I got a bad review <laughs> on the opening night and the review singled me out for what um, the critic called, this is burned into my brain, a hopelessly forced and contrived Southern accent. <laughs> Could you be more specific? No. <laughs> yeah, and of course, everyone thought this was hysterical because I wasn't doing an accent. <laughs> and, you know, at the time it was funny, but it was also mortifying. Um, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And I have to say that that's something that has stayed with me. And now, you know, decades later, when, when I'm reviewing the performances of others, that's something that is in there for me somewhere. And, and, and you know, understanding that you, you need to not make assumptions. You need to not assume that you know more about their choices or you know more about than they do because you don't. So it, it, it was unpleasant, but it was helpful, if that, if that makes sense. Well, at that, um, at that point in, your, at t in time, did you, did you ever think that you would be in his shoes? No. No, no, this is, this is, this, no, I never would have thought this. I guess I'm one of those examples of, you know, you, you never know what life is going to do with people. Um, Cause I was doing that for a while. I was doing the theater thing for a while, came to the conclusion, well, you know, I'm, I'm not God's gift to the profession and, you know, and I'm, I'm, I want to be able to eat. Um, the other, the other track in my life had always been and still is a uh, mental health work. I'd always even in college, I was, I was always volunteering on crisis hotlines and all this kind of stuff. So I went back to school, um, went to grad school and, you know, got a, got a clinical degree. 
and then was working in that way. So like kind of this other part of me sort of got packed away for a while. But as time went on, you know, there was, I was looking for a creative outlet, um, number one. And then number two, I was aware, you know, because I kept studying. I was still studying voice just for fun and, I, you know, reading and doing stuff. So I was at this place in life. I had, um, you know, a fair amount of knowledge and a fair amount and a lot of passion and what, you know, kind of all dressed up and nowhere to go, right? I mean, you know, what, what do I do with that? It had never occurred to me to write, but, you know, I thought, well, you know, what would happen? So I started writing little articles and sending them into places and people started going, thank you, do you have more? And it really, that's sort of what happened. Um, it, Did you it, use a typewriter? It, yeah, it, it, it snowballed from there in, in, in terms of, um, you know, going to opera news. Oh, which, by the way, I'm told I, must, I, I should recite a disclaimer. I'm not here representing any of the publications I write for. So any opinions I express are all my own, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, we got that out of the way. <laughs> Our legal <laughs> department will hand take care of it. Don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, one of my 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 fantasies was to have something in opera news magazine. I su subscribed to it since I was a teenager. And, yeah, I didn't care what it was. I just, you know, I wanted to be in so you know i sent them things and you know i got a lot of you know no thank you and you know kind of forgot about that and then you, you fast forward a couple of years or or something um they needed someone i don't know exactly why i've, I've never been privy to the story but they they needed someone and at this point i'd been writing for you know companies and stuff and doing articles so i was recommended to them and got a call he's no longer with the name this wonderful guy bill madison william madison who used to be the editor there if look him up he's great he's did the autobiography of madeline uh the autobiography the authorized biography of madeline khan oh uh, uh, um, madeline just khan. wonderful wonderful man wonder lovely man and wonderful writer and at the time he was the editor over the review section and he had contacted me and, you know, he asked, could you send something in? And I said, well, this is kind of funny. You actually, if you check your files. <laughs> <laughs> you have my work. <laughs> you have several things from me. And then he sent me an email back, the subject line of which said, La Forza del Destino, which I thought was very sweet. Um, so, you know, I started doing some stuff for them, you know, for, for one year, I kind of, you know, Martin Bernheimer sometime was flying into Chicago doing lyric and when he couldn't I did it and then and then I kind of took that over so that's how that happened did and you then, ever get to meet Madeline Kahn no I did not okay well thank you for stopping by <laughs> <laughs> there it is but anyway so that's that's sort of how this all happened and it, it it's yeah you, you know again i would not have expected it but so for the last you know couple of decades that's been that's been me that's what i've been doing i mean i i that probably sums up most of us in the performing world that we kind of just came to it in our own way and but i think you're right like similar to what you said at the top of the show mark that this is a perspective we rarely hear from that's just like how does one become a critic? How does one become a musical, like, literary contributor? And there it is. I guess. I mean, you know, some people do study formally, but, you know, um, I, I think I was just someone that I pulled various experiences from other spheres in my life together. I, I you know, people I've been trying to think, like, if I have a, like, a philosophy of, um, right, and, and I, I, wish I had something wonderful and esoteric to say about that. Um, I don't really, I, I will say, excuse me, if it's interesting, I mean, I think I can share with you just a lot of sort of what my own sort of internal guideposts are. Please. Oh, for sure. I, I was going to say, like, and to your credit for everyone who's listening and anybody who knows Mark's work, that the one thing that I found consistent in all of your writing, especially in, in um, as a critic, is that you are incredibly fair. 
and oh my god oh thank and when, you no of course no mark i'm not going to disparage you on this show <laughs> i invited you well, I, I <laughs> Well, yeah, like, I honestly feel that, like, everything that you, that I've seen of your work, like I said, is fair. And when you and I had talked uh, previously, that you strive to actually be as constructive as possible. And because, as you said, like, you, you don't have a history behind you to suggest that you're trying to exercise any demons from your past of like well i didn't get this role and i didn't get this opportunity so, so this is my I'm, way i'm gonna be back. the bitchy critic from hell yeah right there's, there's now, plenty I, I will share um someone told me a story um long ago and then i read it subsequently which, which this a long time ago that meant a lot to me it was um the the great welsh baritone um sir garant evans was once asked about critics and 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 you know what you know his impression of critics and he was once asked what what quality did he feel was the most important in a critic and his reply was good manners oh and <clears throat> touche I, I try to have good manners i i, I you know, when I talk about the things I try and do, I, I make no claim to perfection. I'm not saying I always succeed or reach my own ideals. But, you know, I, I, I try and have good manners. And I try, this all sounds so very basic. But when I criticize a performance, I try to remember that this is about them. It's not about me. Um, you know, we all love our words, and I certainly, you know, I, I'll say, make the occasional bitchy remark, or, you know, I'll, well, I'll I mean, fall in I, love with my we, words sometimes. We can't help it, Mark. It, it's, it <laughs> comes with the territory. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for the most part, I really try and, and, and you know, remember that it, it, it's it's about them and so something that has pleased me I, I was so pleased with your remark there Richard about being fair um other people have told me that they've liked reading my things because they they get a sense of how everybody sounded and this sound again that sounds so crazy and so basic but I think people who love the art form when they read a review I think they want to know what did the singer sound like, you know? What did the orchestra sound like, you know? The the the, the soprano, how did she handle the display writing? What was their body in the middle register, you know? That's what I think they want to know. I I once read a review of a production of Manon once, and it it, it was a deal where this guy was given a lot of space too, which you know we aren't always. And I was reading this review, and I'm here to tell you that the bulk of this review of this performance, he went on for paragraphs talking about like what a crap opera it is <laughs> and, you know, what what a terrible composer Massenet was and on. And then you got to the very bottom and there were two or three lines and it's like Bob sang this role and Carol sang this role and Ted sang this role. And, that. and it, I, I try and avoid that, you know, I think people want to know yeah they want to know what the production looked like it sometimes if you're talking if, if there's something relevant about a particular piece you have to do that but basically you know i think they they want to know how things sound um i also try to avoid some of this is maybe an interface with my other work but i i just what am i trying to say here i i I don't think cruelty is helpful in any endeavor in life. Um, I, I, I just don't. I mean, yes, I'll be bitchy occasionally, but I, I, I don't think I am cruel. Um, I stay. I generally stay away from people's physicality, other than how how it is expressed artistically in a performance. I am not into body shaming. Um, there's, I, I, some years ago, I saw um, a regional production of Faust, which was a very effective production. And in the church scene, they did this really cool thing where the stage was dominated by a huge crucifix with a Christ on the crucifix. 
And at the end of the scene, the crucifix revolved and the Christ morphed into Mephistopheles ooh, ooh. Um, on the cross. And, you know, he was in a loincloth and the whole thing. Oh. It was re really cool. It was really cool. And I read a review that basically spent several sentences talking about the singer involved and, you know, his dad bod and, you know, and why was he, you know, we didn't need to see him in a loincloth. Well, speak for themselves. Well, and at the same time, like, you can talk to any Catholic that if they've seen the, you know, Christ on the on the cross, that body image is very hard to attain. <laughs> <laughs> Especially as an we, opera singer. Be my God, and I we may never... not want to. Yeah. But, but it, was, so, it, it was unfortunate because I, I won't use the name, but I mean, this singer, this, this, this bass, bass baritone is, you know, one of our Muravi, you know, he's someone that sings leads in all the regionals. He's doing Copper Mario roles and covering at the Met. <clears throat> and I mean, he's one of our more valuable singers. And, so and just leave he, him know, alone. I, hmm? So just leave him alone. And <laughs> yeah, just leave bought. him alone. And it's like, you know, who? who How was the singing? That, <laughs> that's what I wanted. Exactly. Thank you. How was the singing? Let's talk about the singing. So, you know, I try and avoid, I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen those funny videos where singers are reading their own bad reviews. Oh, yes. No, like, so <laughs> close friends just actually reading them out loud and they're like. Well, there's one and may I call if I offend whoever wrote this. I mean, oh. I don't know who did. Don't but worry. There was um, one, uh, again, someone who's one of our more valuable singers, a wonderful tenor who I have seen done, do, um leads in the regionals and I have seen him jump into major roles in A-list houses. Um, you know, this is, this is no slouch. This is, this is a damn good singer. Um, you know, a somewhat large man. And he read a review where like the critic had said something like he sang with all the warmth of a 300 pound toaster oven. <laughs> and I, why? <laughs> Again, hey, maybe, that's pretty warm. Uh, <laughs> if whoever wrote this is watching this, I'm sorry, and you can say something bad about me. But I, why would you say something like that about someone? I mean, I mean, what what does that accomplish? You know, so, so I try exists. and um, I, me... I, I, I I try and avoid that kind of thing. I I will say I am very aware that there are any number of people who consider me a lightweight and. I am very aware that a lightweight are, because you don't you don't attack singers or that you are just a, re, a Chicago somebody who lives on the Miracle Mile and no 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 I can't say anything to a Chicago but but I think that I'm um um I tend to be positive um See, I, now, I, that that's what we need to change I mean that's not you, one couldn't shouldn't be considered ought not to be considered lightweight just because they are constructive with their criticism but no that's i agree i agree the course you with see your that. field but i um i decided for myself a long time ago if this makes sense that if if, if people are going to condemn me i would rather be condemned as a dumb guy who loved the music than a smart guy who held himself above the music. Mm. Um, if, if, if I had to make that choice, that's where I'd want to be. I one one of my favorite critics, when you look at the older crit was uh, John Steen. If you ever read John Steen's criticism and Steen, even when he was being negative, you were always aware that he loved the music and that he loved the musicians and that, that he had such great respect for them. And I've, you know, I, I certainly don't put myself in a category with someone like him, but I've, I've, I've tried to, I've tried to emulate a little bit of that, I think. Um, and Mark, kind of touching on that, um, how, like, you know, nomenclature aside, like how people regard perhaps your writing now, and like you and I were talking before, what would you say is a big, difference or comparison to what the critic's job was 
50 years ago, 60 years ago, and how they could write back then versus what has kind of evolved over time and what is being write, written about now. Yeah, and, and, and things have changed. It's like, I I admit I will get a little defensive sometimes when I'll read conversation about, you know, the wonder, you know, whatever happened to those wonderful critics of old who did this? Well, I'll tell you one thing that happened to them is that the space they were allotted shrank down to this. Mm. Um, so what is it now, like 500 words? Uh, that that now, that's it. That 500 words is actually pretty decent that's, now. That's pretty liberal, yeah. I, yeah, now I, th I actually think 500 words is, a, is, is fairly decent, but I've, I've seen ones, where, you know, where you get like 200. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, and, and we also, this is a little bit of what we were talking, something that, you, you know, the critics role, I think, has changed a little bit because the position of the arts in the larger society has changed a great deal. There, there, there are ways, I mentioned Richard Perlman a minute ago. He, he had mm -hmm. an expression where he used to talk about how opera was a blinking signal from a planet far away. And that has changed in our society what one of my one of my favorite kind of like youtube rabbit holes to fall down is um now i'm really about to date myself children remember that <laughs> um the game show what's my line oh yeah well before your time in my defense it actually started before my time i mean it, we overlapped but it actually started <laughs> before i was born but you remember on What's My Line where one of the features every show was you had the celebrity mystery guest. Mm -hmm. And so the celebrity panel had their masks and they had to guess who the mystery guest is, right? And when you look at the old ones from the 50s and the stuff going, those celebrity guests, I mean, Salvador Dali was on there. Um, a lot of musicians were on there. And there, look it up. There's a fabulous one with Helen Trouble great Wagnerian soprano of the man. Mm -hmm. the, and Helen Trouble, you may remember, she had had some conflicts with Rudolph Bing because like she sang in nightclubs and did there's this kind of stuff. Well, Helen Trouble was the guest and like the celebrity panel, they're asking the questions and you hear the audience rumbling and you've got Arlene Francis, you know, with her mask that, you know, are, are you in show business? You know, <laughs> you know, getting kind of closer and closer. But you could hear the audience rumbling as, as Arlene's starting to figure it out. And Arlene Francis says something like, did you just recently have a conflict with your boss? <laughs> and you hear the studio audience go, ooh. <laughs> you know, you look at that now, 50 years later, 60 years later, you think, how extraordinary is it that this studio audience in a game show, a studio audience in a game show, not only knew who Helen Trouble was, but they knew that she had had this conflict with Rudolph Bing. This is not something we would see today. True. You know, so I think um, there's ways our, our roles have changed and there's way, I don't mean just critics, I mean all of us, there's ways we now are called upon to be ambassadors for the art form in in a sense that maybe wasn't quite as necessary some decades ago um something when i was talking about my background i i have to i can sound like a broken record on this so i want but you know one thing that happened with me was I grew up at a time when arts education was still a standard part of the public school curriculum. Mm -hmm. We were taken to the symphony. We were taken, we listened to Rusty Visits the Orchestra. You know, um, I, I remember a teacher playing the William Tell Overture and pointing out the different, th this has disappeared. And, and there's ways we now all need to educate in a way, we all need to be ambassadors in a way because that, um, you know, again, not only what happened to critics that they get this tiny space allotment, but we also have the challenge now, like if you're writing for something like Opera News, you have an educated audience, this isn't an issue. But if you're writing for a newspaper, you know, in, in one of the medium sized cities, 
you got this much space and that much of that much space needs to be used to explain the plot of Rigoletto, you yeah. know, or the plot of Traviano. You know, this is, this is, this Who's is Who's Chile? Chile? Huh? I said, who's Barfu Chile, for God's sake? <laughs> a man with a spade. Uh, <laughs> no, but you're you're totally right, Mark. Like when you're, I, I think about this. I've had this conversation with several people. When you talk about the the current world of critics and what their job is, and you're right, it has turned into this ambassadorship, this like becoming an educator. And quite frankly, when you think about it, the I won't call it like the diminution of the arts in society, but just, you know, it's um, less awareness, like uh, general awareness that what, it, especially now these days, what is the point of ripping a production to shreds? What is the point of, of giving a skating review to any given singer? Because at the end of the day, if you're just going to turn your audience off, who already is having trouble accessing this art form in the first place, you're not actually even advocating for the art form you're you're writing for, let alone your own job, because you're just writing yourself out. It seems like for, it seems like so much these days that critics, not that they're especially in the states, not that they're shying away from being overly critical, but like you said, they're actually playing this dual role of saying we're actually trying to uplift the arts because most of our readers who subscribe to XYZ newspaper don't even know that there's an opera company in town, let alone that there was a show. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question, I'm sorry. I just have to say, so Richard, so are you, are you to say that if it's a a shitty production, people should still go and and not know (laughs) that and not know that it's, that it's, well, I mean, we're not debating if the show is good or not. I'm just saying when it comes to whatever your, your um, if your modus operandi is to just give negative opinions, you're not necessarily advocating for the current situation we find ourselves in this country in the arts. So, Mark, what, it's a delicate balance then from a critic's perspective. Like, how do you, how, how where do you find that? Where's the fulcrum? Yeah, I, th- I that's a great question. I because I think there is a delicate balance between you want to be the ambassador, you want to you know accentuate the positive, but you also want to up, uphold standards. I You're mean, right. we do need to uphold standards. Um, you know, and I it, it's not not typical of me, but you know, I've written, I've, I've slammed some productions. I don't tend to slam singers but um i've slammed some productions i will say won't use the name but one of the um most uncomfortable reviews i ever had to write was as one of one of a fella he was a leading singer. we don't see him too much now but for a few years thank, there, he was thank one of the- you mark hmm? i said thank you mark <laughs> <laughs> We hold you personally responsible for that. No, <laughs> no, I didn't do it. But I, um, it, he, this guy kind of crashed and burned in the middle of um, a performance I was doing, and it was kind of a difficult thing because on the one thing, I mean, I can't lie. I mean, I had to say crash and burn, but I just felt morally, ethically, I needed to say it needs to be understood. This was not a representative performance. You know that that this was not. Is that I, I also I very often will reference audience reaction, mm. and there are times I will refer. There are times I've said such and such and so and so was not this did not work for me. However, yes. you know th- th- there was you know it, ex- it's so funny. It's so, for someone else. It's great that you mentioned that because we uh, read a comment from a uh, viewer um, Jim that he's been at some really bad performances where the music and the drama trumped. Not to use a, a bad a bad name, uh, <laughs> yeah. the bad the bad performance and the audience didn't mind. Uh, the audience needs to be experienced in order to have the discernment, um, mm. which you know I think de- it depends where you are, um, and the on your audience and and their level of discernment. But certainly, oh yes, and and audiences have changed. I, 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 people watch for different values now which sometimes that's okay sometimes it's a little disturbing i'm I'm on a facebook group um 
I'm on a lot of Facebook groups, but I'm on, I'm, I'm kind of, particularly in the pandemic, it's like, it's, I'm just, I'm what else is there to do? I have a problem. I need a program. <laughs> Actually, Mark, Mark, this is why we called you here today. <laughs> this is your intervention. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's one group I'm on and, and it's there. On the one hand, there's a lot of interest and a lot of passion for opera and, and, and please thank you, Jesus. You know, we need to encourage that. But I will sometimes get a little discouraged because, you know, a, a lot of the experience is coming from the HDs and the HDs are wonderful and it brings the art form to people who couldn't experience otherwise. And it's wonderful. I, I support it. It's wonderful. But I do find that you have some people that that will watch these as though they're watching feature films mm -hmm. and they obsessively focus on physicality. It's, uh, you know, He's too old to be the prince. She's too fat to be the princess. You know, they tend to focus on this kind of thing. You're, which you're I not. You're not in like the third tier at the Met. You can't see anything. You know. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And and you know, I I want to. I have been in the house at the Met for the HD performance, and then seen you know the. Um, the recap in the movie theater the the next week you know it's a completely different experience but you know i find that um and i will get a little disturbed that that, that you know some of the folks are focusing so heavily on on physical appearance and also on technology you'll see mm -hmm. when when you know they'll they'll, they'll rerun um some of the old the uh, you know live from lincoln center you know things from the late 70s the 80s and you'll see some folks that will, you know, oh, I don't want to see that. The picture's not good. And, the, and you know, and, and don't you hate it when they do that? And it's like, we're talking, you know, like history. Krauss, Sutherland. And, yes, the greats. You know, the greats. Um, you know, and that, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm dating myself, but, but I. Um, it's time to break up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As you were saying, Mark. <laughs> no, I was just saying, you know, I initially became an opera fanatic through recordings, but, you know, I, I, I was born just in time that when it was available to me, I did get to see a lot of that. Gener I mean, I saw them in later career, but I did get to see a lot of, a lot of that. Gener I mean, you know, I saw Sutherland, I saw Domingo a lot. I saw Scotto, I saw Franey, I saw Price. Mm. Um you know, I, 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 I saw these people and, and I have Franey. I, I saw one of Franey's final Mimis. Ah. She was, I believe, 60 years old. At She's the my favorite butterfly. Oh, I, oh, I love Franey. And the, um, the opening night had been, was on the radio. And I remember like listening to it on the radio and kind of thinking, yeah, well, Morella's sounding you know, a little old here. But then a week later when I was in the house and I saw a subsequent, and th this was one of the most extraordinary performances. I, it was pure theater magic. Mm -hmm. When you were there in the theater with her, I defy anyone who saw that performance to, to say that she was a day over 18. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was just, just miraculous. You know, um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm babbling, but yeah, but you know, I, 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 you know, the audience expectation has changed a little bit. And I, I think that can be very tricky. And, you know, how do you encourage that passion, but also kind of, you know, have you thought about maybe, you know, looking? So I'll, what's your, what's your ratio like between ambassadorship and, um supportiveness and constructive wow. criticism i mean you know because some of these all productions aren't created equal and there are no. some that you may feel oh my god what in the hell were they thinking but you can't because you want people to go and support the arts you, you want know. people to go yeah you know ava I, I i don't think i can answer that question specifically because that ratio is going to be will vary widely depending mm -hmm. on you know the 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 product at hand. I think that's a a hard but one. But it's I, surely something you're think, be, thinking of when you're trying to fit condense it into two hundred yeah. words. You know, 
You know, I have little things that I'll think, I, I think it's very important to support young artists. Um, that is a particular interest in mine. I actually had a cover story on Opera News on singer training a few years ago, which I was very pleased about. Um, I, I think it's important to support young artists. And, um, you know, these are the people who are going to be taking this over. And, and certainly this is not to say that if they do something and it's not good, this is not to say that you say it's wonderful if, if it isn't. I'm not saying that. But I am saying if they do do something good, say it and say it loudly. Um, I also have a feeling, particularly when it, when I review performances from young artists that are in the company in, in the company app, mm -hmm. um, young artist program like like Ryan Center. It, it, occasionally, there may be a special event where you have to mention it's well. It's like um, the um, Ana Maria Martinez is going to you know about to do this um, um, you know. Passion Latina. I think Richard, you're going to be involved in that, are you not? Oh, am I? <laughs> you're talking about the very thing I'm going to. That's premiering next Sunday. No, no, no. you be yes. really, you be hard on Richard. <laughs> I'm uh, not being hard on Richard. But, you know, that, that is the kind of thing where you know, since it's being billed, it is the Ryan Center doing. You talk about the Ryan Center, but I, I, it's something I do consciously. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever noticed this is generally in like the standard main stage productions, you know, the, the like, like the yap artists who are doing a role. I, I do not mention the fact that they are mm. a yap artist. I don't mention a lot of people do, and that's fine. And it, you know, it's a way, you know, that's fine. Some people even said, well, you need, you need to, you know, you need to highlight the yap. Yeah, I do. But my, I, I, I think there can be a tendency when you do that, that people have a tendency to, review the fact that that singer is in the app yeah. as opposed to reviewing the actual performance. And that can also be an easy and sometimes unfair way to squash people. Um, you know, you, you, the, the adjectives like, you know, unformed, um, you, 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 you know, I, 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 I I try and be careful about that and, and support the young folks. I'm, I, I'm often described as unformed. I question very well. What was that? Uh, I said, I'm often described as unformed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm formally formed myself. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> Disformed. <laughs> I just have but, to uh, I, I just have to tell you quickly, Mark. So when you were talking about the game show earlier, I, I once <clears throat> uh, several months ago was interviewing um, Martin Katz and Margot Garrett and Warren Jones on the same episode, and Martin was talking about Zoom and how it's like Hollywood Squares, and I said, "Are you Paul Lind?" <laughs> what I forget what, what was his response? It was several seconds of silence, and him going, "Abe, you're showing your age." <laughs> that's what that's, and that's how you you answer in a classy way martin's like no i'm not gonna answer that <laughs> sorry Clearly we had to share that memory show. well we have you know all the talk about age and you know moving on and stuff think things do change and we we have a lot of challenges now in terms of um you know the standard romantic repertoire and things, you know, particularly on issues of feminism, it can be be that that's become trickier and trickier. You know, the issues of racism. Um, we this is stuff we all need to think about more and do a better job with. You know, I um, Richard, you're about to say something. Oh, no, I was going to say, and especially from your vantage point, when with what is happening, especially just within this year, culturally of that awareness, yes. especially in the operatic world where those questions are finally getting attention to be answered when it yes. comes to exoticism in opera, when it comes to race in opera. Um, where do you feel like that's going to have an effect in the critical world? Because so many times that would be commentary. That's to say like, oh, this doesn't look like, you know, Nagasaki and Madame Butterfly. They're not acting acting like as if they're real geishas or they could be more Asian and that kind of thing. Where do you feel in from a critical point of view that is going to maybe morph into? Well, you know, I, 
I think it has something to do with looking at a lot of these pieces and, and clearing away some of the cobwebs and looking at them and say, can, can, can we see these pieces? Can, can we see other values in these pieces? I, your, your guest, um, 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 Lydia Yankoskaya from um, Chicago, she said something, I may mispronounce that, but she said something wonderful last week, which I love. She was talking about uh, the sexism in some of the pieces. And she talked about, uh, you know, that you need to sit back sometimes and realize like, it, is that sexism really there or are we responding to how it's always been interpreted? You know, mm -hmm. are, are we responding to the traditions that have been handed down? God, I, I, I love that. I so agreed with her. And I had actually a couple of years ago, I had an experience. I, I was asked to write an article about Gilda in Rigoletto as viewed through the, the eyes of the Me Too movement. Ooh. Mm. Interesting, interesting kind of thing. Now, I have to say, first, I was terrified because before I even did this, I had people yelling at me because you're a man. Why are you writing this? <laughs> now, did you do it from Sparfu Chile's eyes? <laughs> Who? <laughs> no, I did not. But um, I had... I was nervous about it. I, I actually, this was for an editorial staff, which was all women, and I'd been recommended to them by a woman where they, you know, and they, that's kind of why. And they thought, but, you know, I, I had to look at that character. And, you know, we've tended to see Gilda, you know, as just one example, as kind of, you know, the codependent, you know, victim, you know, weak little pretty thing. And, you know, when I tried to get away from that and like, like look at it in a different sort of way, I found that in many, I, I feel very differently about that character now. In many ways, I feel that she is the strongest person in the opera. Mm. Um, the opera, there's this depravity that runs through the opera. And like, Gilda is very sheltered and naive, and she obviously makes some very bad choices. But she's the only person in the opera who has a developed internalized moral compass, the only one, she's the only one in the opera who has an ethical center and who has the strength to act on that center. Again, she makes bad decisions, but you know, I found when you looked at it, the piece that way, then her death was no longer just kind of, you know, the murder of the pretty little victim girl. It was really like the death of moral order. Mm. It was, you know, the death of, the death of the last thing is good. Someone pointed out to me, and this is true, you know, Rigoletto was based on a Hugo, Victor Hugo play, as was Le Miserable. And you look at Jean Valjean and Le Miserable, it is a principal death. And I think that happens if we look at Gilda in a different sort of way. It, it is a principal death. I, I, I don't know that I'm exactly answering your question, but, but you know, in terms of, you know, um, um, what she had to say last week, you know, I think, I think we need to be more, we need to be more willing to let go of tradition. Uh, we, we need to be more willing to hold on to, you know, the tra tradition that is good, that helps us to interpret this form of me. But, but, you know, some of the things I think we can kind of say goodbye to now. Um, I, had, I had a similar experience doing a, a program article a couple of years ago on Bohem with looking at Mimi and realizing how, particularly when you realize when the piece was created, really what a very modern character she is. I mean, she, she, she strives for sexual freedom. Um, you know, she, she's assertive. She strives for, but, you know, this isn't just this, you know, I don't know. I'm babbling. No, 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 I totally get it. Like, she's not a sickly person. The same with Jilda. Like, these are actually very empowered yeah. characters because they're making decisions of their own volition as opposed to being told. And even when they are, they're like, I defy that. Rodolfo is just like, stay with me. She's like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> well, and we, we need we need to recognize things change. It's like like you look at um, Zauberflirt, mm. which, you know, is one of the more problematic mm. kind of kind of pieces and that, that was actually the first opera i saw with surtitles and you got to that point where zarastro you know says to pamina you know something about you know you need a man to guide you 
And that was like in the 80s. And there was kind of this, you know, once upon a time, it was a very serious line that we were in the 80s. There was kind of this discomfort. You see Zabra Flirta now when they try. That's the biggest laugh in the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes. the biggest laugh in the show. And maybe should be. You know, she also made the point about, you know, maybe we need to get rid of some of those 30 year old uh, surtitle sets. Oh, God, could we? Or, or I mean, For even just the uh, even just the translations and like, that's good that this is yeah. this has existed in perpetuity, but let's not modernize it, but like actually make it more relevant. And actually, this is a job for directors and for um, designers that why don't you cater to a different interpretation rather yeah. than sticking to the old traditions all the time? Yeah. Well, you look again with that, you know, Monostatos is one of the, you know, you know, quintessential problematic characters mm -hmm. for this kind of thing. And I've seen people do creative things. I saw a production where he was in um, um, Zebra Stripes and Papageno's line became, well, they're, they're striped animals, why not striped people? people. <laughs> Which was a nice way of handling, but you know what? The title said Schwartz. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people did, but, but <laughs> like, you know, can we, can we maybe, can we maybe change that? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we need to move along. My, my fear is I, I don't want to lose. I don't want moving along to be, I don't want to, to go where we're, we're focusing so much on, you know, needing the singers to look like movie stars and so forth. I, 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 I something I like to do since I'm, I'm afforded, you know, the opportunity I'm given seats to go see things. I like to take people who have maybe never had this kind of experience. And I like to take young people hmm. who have not had this kind of experience. And there's a young woman that works her work for, I took to something a couple of years ago, young African-American woman. She had a really good time. And her comment was she loved all the diversity on stage. And she was referring to race, but she was also talking about body types, you know, and, 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 I thought her response was very healthy and we need to not lose that. Um, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I think it's, you just said it, like it's the diversity that is representative of all of us, of the actual people who are doing this. And to your credit, Ambassador Ketterson, thank you for <laughs> doing your part. In, <laughs> are you being in named to the, the Biden administration? Are you part <laughs> of the transition team? <laughs> I don't think they'll be asking. Um, Mark, I'm wondering, like, like, how are you keeping busy when there's no live performances to review? Or, because the, the jury's out on reviewing digital content. Although some no, people, it's, so, it's starting. Um, that's what I understand something that i think is you know make lemonade out of lemons is something that's kind of interesting right now is we're, we're starting to see like small things get coverage that would not have been covered before mm. you know small recitals and small you know things are now starting to get coverage um because that's what we have i i think that's a good thing i i will say abe for a while there i i you know i wasn't busy i um so summer there's a trickle down i mean you know i'm not i don't make my full living doing this so you know there's a trickle down but but it hits you i remember the um rudolph bing on one of speaking of bing on one of his rants about critics said that uh, he thought critics were very frustrated people because they had to wait for somebody else to do something before they could do anything <laughs> and you read that and you know your knee jerk is like well how how insulting, but then you sit back and uh, it's kind of true, uh, <laughs> you know, and summer was rough because um, summer is usually a busy time for me because of the summer festivals. I'm doing lots of artist interviews and, you know, like, and that, you know, that was gone. We, we had the whole thing, the uh, Duray show that swept through the Midwest mm. here. I don't know how it was where you are. It took off part of my roof, which, um, um, in a normal summer, I would have been able to cover and this summer it went on a credit card, you know, cause yep. those, you know, those, those writing opportunities are there. It is getting better. I think, I think, you, you, you know, to answer your question, Amy, I, I, I think there's more willingness now to start to look at the online stuff. 
you know, and cover it. Where, where at first, I think everybody was, well, we just need to hunker down. This is temporary. And, you know, and as things have gone on, people are adjusting and going, well, no, we need to, you know, we, we need to be giving attention to those things. And there's some wonderful things happening. I, I you know, Some really creative things. And, and there's things like this. I mean, you want to talk about the ambassador. I mean, what you guys are doing, um, there's so much like this going. There, there, there's a stuff. I don't know if you've been watching Lawrence Brownlee's. Of course. Interview yeah. series. Oh, my God. I mean, you, you talk about. And he has got to be our best opera ambassador since Beverly Sills in, in, in you know, that kind of, you know, bringing it to the people kind of thing. You, you, the stuff you're doing, Alexandra Lobianco. Uh, and uh, and our Herlick friend and doing. advisory board member, Karen Slack, has been, you mm -hmm. know, picking up the slack for the rest of us. <laughs> um, just extraordinary amount of work out there that people are doing during these times and, and giving folks both in the know and um, the regular public an inside look at to what we do and what it takes to 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 uh, be part of this art form. It's remarkable. And yeah, and we're, we're seeing things when you ask about art songs. One thing that's really kind of nice about this is now like recitals, you know, like small piano recitals or small, actually are reasonably comfortable in, in, in a cyber medium in a way that a huge theatrical production is not. I know you had Nicholas Pan on. I mean, his um, you know, his group did some great things. Fabulous. Uh, they 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 had a, a live um, premiere last night, which I watched with um, Kareem Suleiman, which was just oh, yeah. absolutely remarkable. Did uh, you see the Baroque? No. It, uh, all all women composers uh, um, um, oh, from, yes, from yes, the yes. Baroque area. Really, just beautifully done. Amanda Majeski and 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 you know Pan, and it was just. So there, there are things happening. We're going to get there. We're going to make All it. in due time. In the meantime, it looks like you could just watch and listen to everything imaginable with your archive behind you. <laughs> Again, that's just the overflow. Oh, yeah. This that's is, the overflow. This is the annex. Uh, <clears throat> Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. We've oh, filled an action-packed hour. It's over oh an hour. Oh, my God. We're kidding. <laughs> Um, you know, this, I think it's, um, I just love having your perspective on the, on, oh, on everything you heart. just said. I'm, I'm so pleased to be invited. Well, we'll have to do it again. If Richard will let you, um, if Richard will, will schedule you again. Richard? Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, it's incumbent on, on me now. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Mark, Check Mark, invite this... Mark back. <laughs> <laughs> this is our thank you so much this thank is our you. most fun you know, part of the show when when we just you get you can give shout outs to whoever you want i'm going to play our theme music here and you you just you just go here we go oh wow shout outs frankly i would shout out to everyone who is out there who is encouraging people to consume the arts anyone who's keeping the arts alive i i would shout out to anyone who is creating something I don't want to sound like Kurt Vonnegut, but it's like, you know, <laughs> you know, I say, you know, write something, write a poem, write a song, draw a picture. Oh, and um, oh, Mark, we forgot to mention Kenneth Overton is another in a person that's like doing great stuff. Fabulous. Daddy, and, yes, 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 yes. And yes, um, oh, your dog and your dog. Your the Claire. <laughs> oh, Claire, I've got it. Yeah, my, my soon to be 20 year old dog. She's I mean, she is she has slept there yeah good night yeah, everyone so big shout out there good night guys <laughs> thank you so much